22. Um, Adam's uh, first session is entitled Methods of Biblical Interpretation in Modern Times, Part 1. Please welcome Dr. Adam Hensley. <clears throat> Thanks, Pastor Darren. Um, yes, I'm not sure about my kids, but I do tell my American Hebrew students that uh, I promise them they'll speak Hebrew with an Australian accent by the end of it. Uh, thank you for the invitation. It's an honor to be here and um, been looking forward to this for, for some time. Um, so thank you to St. Paul's and to Pastor Guntas and to, to all who have uh, in, been involved in preparing this a wonderful retreat and uh, thank you to Dr. Michael and, and Pastor Guntas too for their fine presentations yesterday. Uh, I, like you, was, was listening and uh, just really found it wonderful and I think you'll find that what they've said yesterday will help kind of prepare you for what I've got to say today. I'm, I'm talking about some different things but there's a lot of uh, stuff that will, will resonate with what they've said as well. On that, um, I've got a, a fair bit to cover in a lot of ways. It's, it, in some ways, it's a kind of an impossible task to sum up the modern approaches to the Bible that have uh, evolved, shall we say, over the last few centuries. But nevertheless, I'm going to attempt to do it. Um, and uh, my, my main aim is to give you a good uh, sort of feeling for what that's like, you know, get to know the characteristics of modern approaches to biblical study uh, and, and just how they've changed over the time as well, because uh, I think we find ourselves uh, in, in a lot of ways in a somewhat unique period in biblical studies. Um, so I'm going to start off, and this, these four documents you see here, a, a, a basic outline to, to the whole presentation, both part one and part two. Um, but I'm going to start by introducing the, the topic by giving you a few images that I hope are helpful to got to get a, kind of get a handle on what we're talking about. There's, um, there's a digging metaphor. I mean, we all dig into the scriptures. It's a kind of helpful way to talk about it. Uh, and it, I think it's a particularly helpful uh, image to have in mind when we look at some of the modern approaches that have uh, come about. Uh, historical criticism, the postmodern approaches that I'll, I'll try to give you a taste of as well. Um, they dig. Uh, we dig. We all dig. But the question is how? And how you see the ground has a lot to do with what tools you think are appropriate and what sort of what you expect to find even you know we'll talk a bit about that in a moment so we'll explore that metaphor initially and then we'll re return to it as we talk about the particular methods uh, that are uh, before us then also the triptych I'll explain that a bit more in a moment but you know a triptych is a sort of three paneled painting and I, I want to sh show how that is a useful image as well to think about the, the the task of interpretation and and the ways in which different methodologies have accentuated one or other panels of the triptych. That'll become clearer when we look at that. Then I want to get into the, the subject matter per se. Um, the two major foci I want to look at are uh, historical criticism, or otherwise known as biblical criticism, criticism, higher criticism. I'll talk about definitions a little bit in a moment, but um, and there we're talking sort of post-Reformation, really post-Enlightenment developments. Enlightenment is that time in history where reason is enthroned and um, and everything is sort of centered around the knowing human person. You know, philosophy sort of takes its starting point from, from really radical doubt with Descartes and, uh, and that. And, and that's affected everything, not just uh, science and all the stuff out there. It's affected the way in which uh, people have gone about biblical interpretation as well. Uh, and then after the, the world wars, which had an interesting effect of... of uh, breaking confidence in the autonomy of reason, which doesn't mean we don't stop thinking of reason as autonomous in the modern era, I think it's still the problem, but, um, but certainly confidence in reason took a bit of a plummet uh, after the world wars. The, wor the war to end all wars was supposed to be, be something else, you know, society was moving in a good progressive direction and then what, where did it all end up? End up? It ended up with that and uh, since then you get, you know, what we talk, talk about as the postmodern era and the various, uh, the, the very relative view of truth that has, um, that dominates our current day. So uh, that these two eras, if you like, uh, have their counterparts in, to put an umbrella name on it, uh, biblical studies, you know, biblical studies in historical critical mode, biblical studies in, um, in postmodern approaches too, postmodern criticisms as they're often called. And then we'll wrap up with some responses to all of this and some conclusions. 
Well, I'm going to be focusing on modern ways to approach the biblical study, and I'm not just thinking the Australian context. I've been out of the country for eight years, so uh, look, thinking about uh, what's going on in the world more broadly, uh, it, it's very helpful. I mean, we don't live in a small world anymore. It's a, I mean, a big world anymore. It's a very small world. Um, so why do this? And there are a number of different kinds of um, uh, answers to that, I think, that, that show its value. Why examine biblical study and its history? Uh, theologically, um, everybody uses a, doc- a doctrine of Scripture. And I, I say that very deliberately. Everyone uses one. Uh, I could say everyone has one, and we all have one. But the question is, do we use it? Do we um, operate according to its, uh, its principles? Do we understand Scripture, or do we use Scripture as we understand it? Um, which brings us to the second point, self-examination, which is a basic kind of uh, discipline in the Christian life in all sorts of spheres, right? I mean, we, we self-examine all the time. Every time we come to uh, the Lord's Supper, we self-examine. Um, when it comes to the way we approach the Bible, do we practice what we preach? This is a, an opportunity. I mean, it, yeah, there's a lot of kind of bad stuff out there. We're going to see plenty of it as I survey the, uh, the, 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 the field, as it were. But uh, it's an opportunity too. And I think we need to take hold of that first and foremost, an opportunity for self-examination to practice what we preach. And then there are, to put it uh, in slightly more positive terms as well, missiological reasons to do this. To understand our word, well, just to understand how people have gone about study of the Bible and perhaps get a better understanding of the prevailing attitudes to Scripture that we see all around us. Uh, why or and how is the Bible viewed as just another religious book, for instance? Um, and in, in the process of doing that, to unearth some of the assumptions that, that you know, govern that and the prejudices, the values that undermine Scripture as God's authoritative word. And notice the undermining language. The, I mean, I'm going to be returning to this ground metaphor all the time, uh, so you'll have to pardon a few puns. Um, I'm, so I'm going to, as we especially look at uh, historical criticism, uh, look at a couple of so-called assured results of historical criticism. Uh, this is a, some terminology which ban- is bandied about a fair bit. Supposedly, the result of these centuries of, of criticism are that there are these assured results that we can hold dependably. Uh, I want to explain what some of those are and just show how unassured they really are on their own basis. Uh, you've got all sorts of contradictions going on with them. Um, and, of course, get at the, uh, the underlying pr- uh, presuppositions and influences to get a, sen- a sense of the flavour of the thing. Uh, and then to engage the world. I mean, we don't live in, a, in isolation. We live in the world, in our communities and that. Now, if it, I think here the doctrine of vocation is very helpful because it, it informs the way in which we engage the world and the opportunities that we have. I mean, someone like me, I'm, I'm in academia, and so I have a different kind of opportunity to if you like, take up the, the fight <laughs> um, in, in, a, in a different kind of context. Um, you, you're in your communities, um, you know, pastoring and amongst your neighbours. Uh, there's no doubt many an opportunity to better understand where they might be coming from and to know the reason for the hope that you have, uh, the te- dependability of Scripture as we, we know and appreciate it uh, for all the reasons and many more that Pastor Gunther has talked about yesterday. Now, just as a basic acknowledgement of our experience when we encounter the Bible, and uh, Pastor Dr. Michael talked about this a lot yesterday too, in different ways, um, we experience what I've heard called bumps in the text. I had a doctoral seminar with um, uh, Dr. Richard Schultz from Wheaton College, a fairly heavy hitter in in, uh, these sorts of topics. He... um, he describes uh, what he calls bumps in the text, these, these little details that we encounter and we're not quite sure what to do with them at the time. You know, head scratches. Ah, we, we encounter them, don't we, all the time. Um, so how are we going to call them? What are we going to call them? Are we going to call them contradictions or surprises? Things that make us dig deeper and find out where the deficit in our understanding actually lies. So on the one hand, are we going to assume harmony in Scripture? Scripture interprets Scripture. Or are we going to assume multiple theologies at work, competing views? And in fact, it's that latter uh, approach that has dominated historical criticism. 
and I'll show you how. So back to the metaphors we're talking about. How you see the ground makes a lot of, a lot of difference to what you expect to find in it and how you'll go about digging. You can see on the left there, there's a, a, an open cut mine. On the right, there's a, a girl excavating at an archaeological site. I mean, you're not going to take the, the big backhoe to the archaeological site, are you? And, and likewise, you're not going to get very far trying to mine ore, ore from the ground with a, with a paintbrush. But um, how you see the ground, how the, uh, whether as a miner or an archaeologist, uh, is going to depend, or is going to ch change the way in which you dig in it and it, indeed what you expect to find there. Um, okay, this is all fairly self-evident, isn't it? Do you expect to find ore or layers of civil civilization uh, built one on top of the other and the artifacts that come out of that and that has implications for the kinds of tools you use as well. Uh, I'd add another uh, point to this, the condition of your eye makes a lot of difference too. If your eye is blind you're not going to see anything and you know we, we according to our theology, according to scripture recognize that we all suffer uh, from birth from spiritual blindness so uh, there's our starting point, really. So here's the triptych, the second of the images I want to use. We'll return to the digging metaphor as we, we go along. The triptych uh, is, and this is just an example of one, a three-paneled painting, and you see the center one is where all the focus is. The other two panels are looking in upon the center, um, and the center is even larger as well to, to also accentuate its centrality. Um, see uh, Christ uh, in the middle and uh, everyone else on the outside. Now here's another triptych which helps us to understand a little bit what we do when we approach the scriptures and, uh, and think about the context the, you know, in which the, the, the scriptures are written. Uh, the text, which is that middle panel, should be the largest, and the reader, uh, which is before the text. So you've got the text and there's, there's a context that lies behind it and there's a reader that stands before it. But what's always central? It's always the text. What's our best window into the context? Well, the text. Hence what uh, Dr. Michael was talking about yesterday, the historical grammatical approach, where we, we realize that the text itself gives us, the grammar of the text gives us the best window into the circumstances and the, the purpose of, of the book that we're reading. When we come to historical criticism, on the other hand, we'll see a different picture. It's the, it's the historical context reconstructed according to the, uh, the judgment of the critic that it looms largest and is, makes the text fit it. And uh, we'll, we'll see how that looks soon enough. So uh, with the, te the reader, of course, also, just to look at the other side of the triptych, the reader brings things to the text as well. We all come at the text, we're not a tabula rasa, not a blank slate. Uh, we, we come with our troubles, with our experiences, with our, the influences upon us. Um, is the reader going to overshadow the text? Or will the text speak to the reader and tell the reader what's what? Um, no, I think it's a, it's a helpful image to get us started thinking about that. And I want to apply the same triptych to both to those historical critical approaches and to the postmodern approaches and just see how they generally differ. So as we get back to that first metaphor of digging into the ground, um, here's how I would suggest the, 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 the church sees the, the ground of, of the word. The biblical text is itself bedrock. You don't really dig through bedrock, do you? I mean, you dig to bedrock, but not through it. So, you know, this, this is a metaphor with limitations, to be sure. Um, I've got the archaeological tell hiding behind. You can sort of see the little layers behind it. Um, but scripture itself is inerrant. It's, it, it's clear, it's unified in its, its message. Uh, and if we're digging anywhere, it's through the mud and the silt and everything that blinds us. Uh, you know, that, that, that condition of spiritual blindness that we have uh, and deafens us. And, and there's such things as the, the spirit of our age, uh, idols our idols, whatever form they may take. And uh, idolatry is, as, as Dr. Michael talked about yesterday, a, a huge theme in Scripture. And what's the consistent effect of an idol? 
It makes you like the idol itself. It has ears, but it cannot hear. It has eyes, but it cannot see. It dulls the senses and it makes you um, dull to who God is and what he's about. Um, so if we're digging past anything, it's past that. And, uh, well, it's, it's the word that's really doing its work in us anyway. So, again, this is a metaphor with limits, but uh, we'll, we'll see how it's perhaps more helpful for understanding these alternative approaches um, but Isaiah says, in that day the deaf shall hear the words of a book, and out of their gloom and darkness the eyes of the blind shall see. God opening the eyes of the blind and the ears of the deaf. And of course, Jesus quotes this, doesn't he? His first public sermon in Nazareth. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. So this release that our Lord came to give us uh, is spoken about there. So really, uh, when we think about uh, this image, uh, you'll notice we've got a very nice granite uh, triangle here, triangle appropriate for today, uh, uh, Trinity Sunday. Um, Scripture is dependable. It's bedrock. We could build on it. Uh, the church is, in fact, built on the testimony of the prophets and the apostles. Christ, its chief cornerstone. Uh, Holy Scripture is the only judge, rule, and norm, according to which all doctrines must be understood and judged as good or evil, right or wrong. So it's about how do we put that into practice, okay? Well, I'm, I'm about to sort of turn in another direction where we see not that put into practice, but something else. Um, but just perhaps a little bit before I do that, um, I've mentioned this before, the limits of the metaphor are, are to be seen in various ways, but we hear the word, don't we? I mean, in a way, while we talk about digging into the word, it's really the word that is at work in us. Uh, it's the living voice of God that, that is heard and proclaimed and creates faith. Uh, we're passive as God does his work in us and it's that kind of disposition and spirit with which we approach the scriptures. Uh, it is, of course, God breathed. But we can still talk about scripture as our bedrock and scripture itself talks in this way and we've just talked about that a fair bit. I might just add, though, those two underlined headings, the material principle and the formal principle. Uh, I think Pastor Guntas talked a little bit about that yesterday where, or it might have been Dr. Lockwood, one of the two, um, where there's the gospel, the forgiveness of sins, Christ, uh, that is the, the central message of Scripture. The, uh, and uh, the power of our salvation, right? The power of the gospel. Uh, that's the material principle. The, the actual material of Scripture, what it's all about, what it's focused on. But with that comes the formal principle. How do we know this Christ? We know him through the word, through the scriptures. Uh, he's not a, a Christ of our imaginations. He's a, a Christ revealed to us through the God who speaks. So that's that distinction there. And uh, always um, the church has held these together, the material and the formal principle. We can't go sort of ex accentuating one and dismissing the other. It, they go together. But we still dig. Well, let's look at the way uh, the world looks at Scripture and um, doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that it's different. Uh, I have a little picture of Jacques Derrida up there. Uh, so if you know him, you know he's all about the deconstruction of human language and this endless deferral of meaning. He's, he's all about the instability of language, really. And I think that instability is a, a good way to describe the way in which uh, the culture at large and a lot of academics uh, today think about the Bible. Unstable ground, unstable ground, not dependable, not bedrock, but just uh, the product of human thinking, human religiosity, that kind of thing. Um, so no such thing as a solid foundation for the modern uh, biblical critic um, but you can still play in the dirt and there's an awful lot of ink spilled on biblical studies still, even though these convictions are not held. Um, we'll see uh, the, the, just a sheer variety of interests in a moment, 
Uh, certainly not reliable historical revelation. Uh, historical criticism achieved that, in that it eroded the uh, confidence that people have in the witness of Scripture to history. Um, but it provides an occasion to, if you like, dismantle modern day structures of authority. You know, play in the dirt and, and play off one ideology against another and really not trying to stand anywhere but committing oneself to some other ideology, just try to dismantle uh, the status quo. We're going to see more about that when we um, come to look at modern views, postmodern approaches more directly. Of course, it's been a while since the Enlightenment and it's really in that 17th to the current day, 17th century to the current day, uh, the influence of historical criticism that has, has done this uh, overall. Um, but in the more recent times, we've got this much more postmodernist, uh, ideologically driven uh, kind of approach that, that is, uh, again, very plural, very pluralistic. There's a lot of them. So let's just uh, get an idea of what does biblical studies look like in the academy these days? Uh, the the uh, Society of Biblical Literature is the largest society of its kind. I mean, there are tens of thousands of people who attend these things. Um, and and you'll, if you look at the, the sort of sections that they have, or the breakout sections, I mean, they have, it's not, not enough to have one plenary session. You've, you've just got too many uh, things going on for that. You have a lot of sections that are organized as we might expect them to be, according to sections of the Bible. There's a Book of Psalms section, a Gospel of Luke section, a, past, a Pauline Epistle section, for instance. But then you also have a lot of sections which are classified by ideology. And this gives you a good window into the sort of uh, purposeful methodologies that have been developed just in the last few decades. The African-American Biblical Hermeneutics uh, section, the Gender, Sexuality and the Bible section, the uh, LGBT Queer Hermeneutics section, the Feminist Hermeneutics of the Bible section, Ideological Criticism section, and on it goes. I mean, this is just uh, a few from the uh, 2014 one that they had. I think it's down in San Diego, up in San Diego. Um, well, let's look at historical criticism first. And uh, again, this, is, this will uh, occupy us for the remainder of this session, maybe a bit of the next. And then we'll, we'll look at the postmodern uh, approaches uh, after that. First, some definitional things. You'll hear it referred to in a variety of ways. Uh, historical criticism is principally because it was interested in historical questions. And actually, that sets it apart from the postmodern approaches. They tend to be disinterested in history. They're, they're only interested in the contemporary discussion about society and all of that. But uh, historical criticism is sometimes called higher criticism to be distinguished from lower criticism. The lower criticism is what we call textual criticism, where you're, you're looking at those manuscripts that uh, Pastor Kuntas was talking about and, and sort of determining what, what variants are clearly off base and, and which reflect the original text. That's perfectly legitimate and it's what we all do as uh, biblical scholars. Um, but higher criticism is when you sort of go back and deconstruct the text at, at a different level and you're, you're saying, okay, well, I'm going to assume without any manuscript evidence at all, usually, um, that there's a whole bunch of different sources here that someone's brought together and, and arranged in a certain way. Uh, so the text isn't what it seems. It's not the whole that it appears to be. And then they, they go off on, on this kind of a expedition, this digging expedition. Now, um, th it's, it's hard to sort of talk about historical criticism and in that word encapsulate all there is to say about it. It's, 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 imp it's certainly uh, a thing, but in a lot of ways it's a collection of different methods as well. And oftentimes they work at cross purposes to one another. Uh, they're not, it's not all singing in harmony here. Um, but there's a, a bunch of different uh, methods that have evolved, and I'm going to walk you through some of those in a little bit uh, when I take the, an example uh, of, of the Pentateuch and how it's been understood, the five books of Moses. Uh, I talked about the, briefly the assured results of, um, of historical criticism, and uh, just to give you some examples of that, uh, in, when it comes to the Pentateuch, for instance, and we'll look at this a bit more closely in a moment, suppo we're supposedly assured that, that, that the... Uh, the Pentateuch really originated in the exilic period. Okay, we're talking the 6th century BC. Moses, 900 years before that. Okay, so we're talking a, a gross revisionist uh, 
history of, uh, of, of the origins of the Bible here. Uh, similarly, you get a similar sort of thing going on with the, with the Gospels, um, where the, the Gospel writers are, are that much more removed from the person of Jesus. It's sort of, in modern scholars, uh, a lot of them anyway, don't sort of see the Gospels as eyewitness testimonies. Problem there. And there are reasons for their, uh, their conclusions there, which are, are based in their very questionable application of methodologies. I won't really have time to get into that one, but uh, we'll, we'll, I'll show you how it works in the Pentateuch and show you just how flimsy uh, the whole house of cards really is. Uh, in the pastoral epistles, so I want to talk about that one because it's, it's now just assumed that Paul didn't write them. First, second Timothy, Titus, Paul apparently didn't write those according to biblical critics. Um, he did. And uh, there are all sorts of reasons why their arguments for, uh, for the pseudonymity of those letters, that is, they're being falsely named under the name of Paul, uh, are really, really flimsy. And I want to show you that. In terms of the, the name historical criticism, to go to that first uh, word, historical, uh, this is a laudable thing. It's interested in history, interested in historical context. Problems when it comes to how that history is discerned, uh, it's at the expense of the witness of the text so often. And, uh, and unfortunately, there's a lot of deconstruction then that goes on and a reconstruction of history that second guesses the story that the Bible itself gives you. Um, yeah, a good example of this is Julius Wellhausen, very famous for his, uh, the new documentary hypothesis of the Pentateuch, in which he, he didn't just discern different sources, that work had already been done. He didn't do a lot that was new, to be honest. But what he did was he, he redated the sources that were supposedly discovered according to a chronology that showed the, re the religious evolution of Israel's faith. So religion is viewed in a very humanistic way, a, a very evolutionary way, and in fact he was dependent on the father of sociology, August Comte, uh, for his understanding of how religion just evolves, like everything else in the world, in, in the modern world after Darwin, right? Um, so it's a very kind of from below humanistic phenomenological uh, accounting of the text that in the process has to completely dismantle the text as you have it. Now I'm going to look at that example a little bit more in a moment because we'll see that while Julius Wellhausen was very influential um, so much has happened even in historical criticism since then that just calls all of that into question. Um, we'll get to that. Uh, the, but you can see what's going on here. It's the modern historian's better judgment that is calling the shots. This use of reason as master over the text rather than as servant of the text. That's the kind of contrast we're looking at. Uh, so another aspect of this is what of the context, not just of the text, but of the interpreter, of the reader. How does the reader's own context affect the way they're reading? And there's a lot of lot of, that's instructive here, um, because we're going to see that when uh, when the First World War came along, these academics had nothing to say. They had so deconstructed the texts of the Bible into their supposed sources that. There was just nothing to say in the face of that devastation. So people turned to all sorts of spiritual, spiritualism and that is a huge, um, huge thing in the post-war period, spiritualism, because people had lost their connection with their loved ones. Obviously, uh, people had just simply gone missing after the First World War, during the First World War, and looking for something, looking for some connection. Um, but the effect of this on the witness of the church, the, the proclamation of the church was devastating. There was no pointing to Christ, the rock, the first fruits of all who sleep. It just sort of dismantled that and, uh, and left those influenced by it with very little to say. Now, thankfully, thankfully, this is not everybody. Okay, I'm, I'm talking about what, what tended to reign in academia, in, in the big universities. But um, thankfully, uh, the church often had a lot more sense. Um, Oh, I, sorry, I should just return to that point. Oops, there we go. Um, so, with the bankruptcy of source criticism, uh, 
that, that actually gave birth to a whole new criticism and it's called form criticism, okay? I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a moment. But uh, basically, the, the, the fellow who began this, a fellow by the name of Hermann Gunkel, uh, was looking for something more authentic, something that could actually speak to, to the world that I just described. And so he looked for it by assuming Wellhausen's work, but he had to develop something new too. So it's interesting how the context of interpreters uh, often influences the way in which they, um, well, the way in which the whole thing develops. Okay, so onto that second term briefly. Critical, of course, critical thinking is indispensable. And oftentimes the trouble with historical critics is they're not critical enough of their own uh, limitedness and their own uh, application of reason to the situation at hand uh, and, and their own influences. And it, it, oftentimes, you know, their, their own ideologies are, are simply hidden behind a, a facade of objectivity. And this is what characterizes historical criticism. There's this sort of uh, assumption that we could be objective about uh, uh, deciding what this historical context was apart from the text. Well, that doesn't work too well. Now, the other thing, uh, of course, that we've noted is that reason became the master of scripture rather than the other way around. Uh, and really, reason doesn't make a very good master at all. Uh, so I'd say reason is just misshapen here and, and, and used Im improperly. Uh, it should be used. You know, faith and reason go together. I mean, they're not mutually exclusive, but the one serves the other. You know, we, we believe seeking that understanding. So what is the trip? Oh, oh, no, actually, let's yeah, look at this. A um, uh, bit of history. Richard Simon, the father of historical criticism, the father of high criticism in the 17th century, uh, guess what? He was a Catholic priest and uh, he was on a mission to discredit Sola Scriptura. Irony in that or just that's what you'd expect to happen you know, if you're going to do that? How did he want to do it? He, he was trying to show that Moses couldn't have written the Pentateuch but he was starting to discern these sources, you see. Okay? And uh, interestingly, the, I, I think it was he who, who started doing this on the basis of the name Yahweh or Elohim. You know, just sifting out which texts speak of God as Elohim, a Hebrew for God? Which one speak, to, speak of Yahweh, the proper name for God? Now, there's a proper way of understanding these. They're not just alternative names. Um, but he saw them as sources of different theologies, you see. Diff you know, sources that were characterized by a whole different theology. Nowadays, historical critics are, don't even work with that distinction anymore of Yahweh Elohim. <laughs> um, they don't discern sources that way. At least they're very doubtful about it. Um, uh, Spinoza and Semler, just a couple of examples, m notable examples. Uh, again, Dr. Michael talked about this yesterday. Treating scripture like any other literature. Um, now, that's, uh, that, there's a certain amount of common sense about that. I mean, there's, uh, it's written in human language. It's, it, there's, uh, you know, you have... Um, turns of phrase and, and stuff that's common from the ancient world, all sorts of images, uh, biblical writers often borrowed from the world around them. Uh, the point isn't to see the Bible in isolation from its context, but it is nevertheless um, in, in the hands of these um, uh, historical critics, it was to look only at scripture as a human document. I mean, they didn't see it as a divine document as well. I mean, it's like the incarnation, Christ is is, um, is fully human, fully divine. And if we lose sight of either one of those, you know, we, we, we mess up. And it's the same with Scripture, right? I mean, you, you, you look at the, the Scriptures, you recognize that, that God speaks in human language, but God speaks in human language. Uh, and so, anyway, what this, how this tended to affect historical criticism is in the conclusions it would draw so, for instance, Isaiah of Jerusalem, because he, he lived in the 8th century, uh, when it came to the, the latter part of the book, which addresses the captivity in Babylon, sort of a couple of centuries later, um, they sort of assume that, oh, well, he mustn't have written that bit. Why? Because it's later. Well, never mind that he's a prophet. I mean, he's a visionary prophet. He sees, we just heard this morning, he sees Yahweh in his temple. Uh, I'm sure he can see a little way ahead into the future. That's not too hard if you're given that vision by the Almighty. Now, here's a critical one. 
Uh, the idea, and Semler, I believe, uh, is responsible for this, the Bible contains the Word of God, not is the Word of God. So you, you, you're digging into the Word, you're in, no, you're digging into the Scripture, understood with a small s, for the Word of God with a capital W. See the difference? It's not that, um, as we would confess it, Scripture is the Word of God, as a part and uh, as, as a whole and in all its parts. That's what we confess. That's how we, it's an article of faith, it's how we uh, receive the Scriptures. But that's not how they're addressing the Scriptures, it's not how they're studying them. And it has uh, wide ranging implications for obvious reasons. Uh, now, I mentioned before that. Uh, that they operated, these historical critics operated with a, a sort of sense of objectivity about what they were doing. They were, you know, they were sort of developing a, a scientific approach to biblical study. Um, and uh, really, it was just a guise of objectivity. It wasn't a real objectivity. You, uh, I, I mentioned the example of Wellhausen before and how, uh, how much he owed really to sociology and the way in which, uh, or the particular ways in which uh, religion was understood under that discipline, uh, but sociology is not theology, <laughs> and uh, and certainly it, it doesn't is not very well equipped to handle divine revelation. Uh, so that skews your view. Understandably, it skews your view if you're just operating it in this humanistic way. So. Uh, the humanistic agenda really comes to the fore, and, and I guess, you know, if you're trying to study a, a document like the Bible um, in that way, if looking at the, the sort of a scientific approach, you've really only got the humanity to look at, haven't you? I mean, how can you measure the divine? How can you actually put that under the microscope? And so, without that confession of, of divine and human, uh, it, they're always going to end up finding some kind of humanistic origin for the Bible. Uh, and in the process, they read against the grain. And historical critics are, acknowledge this all the time. This is not me saying something of historical criticism which they would deny themselves. On the contrary, they read against the grain. By which I mean that if a narrative presents itself as a unity, oh, better suspect that right away. You better start looking for, um, for sources that exist there. Um, or contrary theological views, which sort of somehow found a, a, a piece in the text as it ended up, but originally weren't, you know? So, uh, when theology is done that way, when the divine revelation is, is understood that way, you invariably end up with quite the mess. So, what does the triptych look like uh, in historical criticism? Well, it looks a bit like this. My animations work pretty well. Uh, yep, they did. Good. The context looms large and it, and it comes to the front. Now, I mean context as the historical critic judges it to be. Notice that the text sort of slipped behind there. Now they're reading the text through the lens of a, a different history that they've constructed and, and therefore are drawing different conclusions about it. So all eyes are really on the context. Uh, and that redefines even what the text is. So if you're Wellhausen, and you're interested in the oldest source, you're interested in the Yahwist source, the most authentic Israelite religion after all these other sources came and messed it up, like those priestly writers, for instance, with all that messy sacrifice stuff that, that he, um, as and some have called him an anti-Semite, actually, uh, Wellhausen, uh, he didn't like any of that stuff. Didn't like any of that and had very minimal understanding of Judaism. Uh, one of the great developments in more recent study of the Bible is our appreciation of, of Judaism. And uh, certainly it doesn't mesh very well with what Wellhausen thought about, about the priestly um, material as he identified it. So we've talked about Spinoza and Semler a little bit uh, and the, the attitude to scripture that they uh, worked with and uh, encouraged. Um, the text basically becomes the product of a religious evolution. And uh, we, we talk about the history of religions, school, uh, Religionsgeschichte, if you Geschichtsschule, <laughs> whatever it is in German, it, it's uh, very, very prominent and still very, very influential. Um, and then um, you've got really the text is, is reflective of, of a human culture. That tends to be where it stops, and, and that's what's sought after. What kind of cultural surroundings are there 
that the, the text gives us a window into, that's where it's at for the historical critic. Uh, and really, of course, the social sciences uh, are especially used at that point. Uh, not much room there for Bible as divinely inspired, inerrant word of God, is there? I mean, you're off on a different tangent right away. Um, basic implication of this, obviously, uh, miracles, very suspect, okay? I mean, we don't tend to uh, account for, the, for miracles under this scheme. And, um, yeah, uh, judgments are basically formed on the basis of, of human uh, perspective and, and, and all its limitations. Well, let's look now at this example I mentioned before, the Pentateuch. And uh, there's, I know there's a lot of kind of jargon here. I've tried to minimize that, but um, it's hard to avoid some of it. This is one of these so-called assured results, okay, that we're supposedly, uh, the, the results of historical criticism have, have given us something that we can depend on fairly surely. Um, and I would suggest that they have, historical critics, critics have seen the ground as kind of like an archaeological tell. And if you know what that's like, the oldest material is always deeper down because one civilization uh, lives there, it's destroyed, and another civilization builds on top of it. So you've got oldest material at the bottom and it kind of goes up from there in, in more recent layers. So the source critics, like Wellhausen, had these sources that they sought to, to find and, and they were kind of like, like they're layered within the Pentateuch. Okay, that's how they're looking at the Pentateuch. So not really a, a harmonious five books of Moses now, but a kind of a, a, a fairly rough and, uh, and ready amalgamation of different religious perspectives. The, the Yahwist is sort of 10th, 9th century. The Elohist, about a century later. The Deuteronom Deuteronomist comes sort of with Josiah and his, his reforms. Uh, and then the priestly writer is this sort of exilic period, uh, so just at, around the 6th century, and the post-exilic period when, is, when Judah is getting back together as, you know, back in Jerusalem and re-establishing itself as a, uh, a province now, but as a community after the destruction of the temple and all of that. And so, you know, for, for Wellhausen, this priestly writer, this one that comes last and who kind of draws the Pentateuch together, is, is really a propagandist who, who sort of wants to um, provide a, a justification for the priestly class as the ruling class, the educated, who are controlling the community. All this sort of suspicion, you see, is at work. So there's a suspicious mind that is brought to the Pentateuch at this point. Um, yeah, so that's, that's like the, uh, the, the sort of image you, you get. So for him, the bottom one, the Yahwist, was the most authentic kind of, of uh, faith there was. Now, uh, these will occur in chronological order. So source criticism has its zenith with him uh, in the late 19th century. Okay? And then you get the post-war um, form criticism that was developed. And uh, as I mentioned, this was really a, re a, a response to the bankruptcy, in a lot of ways, of source criticism, what, the, the sort of finding of these literary sources that they had, uh, that Wellhausen and others had, had discerned. Um, now, with form criticism, they're interested in, in the supposed oral traditions that lay behind these source, sources, you see. So, um, you know, and Gunkel actually used fairy tales as his model for understanding that. Grimm's fairy tales. So, you know, oh, it, these fairy tales are handed down and orally and they, you know. So he, he sort of, uh, there's a lot to form criticism. I, I don't want to, I, I can't really begin to explain the dynamics of how it's done and all of that. But just to give you an idea of how this, uh, this whole endeavor has, has evolved over time. Uh, after that, uh, you'll notice that, 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 that so far we're just dealing with the earliest sources, supposedly. These, all these scholars had very little time for the, the Pentateuch as a final piece. They weren't really interested in the whole, the, the major shape of it. In fact, they th thought of those who edited it, who brought it together apparently, as fairly crude scissors and tape men who kind of stuck stuff together and put it all together. Um, so you get uh, this interest, this growing interest now in a new direction. And this, you know, this actually yields more helpful stuff. 
I mean, while historical criticism has done some, an awful lot of damage, uh, it's also, you know, there's been some good stuff come out of it in later years too, at least in as far as scholars start to look at the final form of the text and they start seeing what we've been seeing all along, right? The harmony of, of the Pentateuch. So redaction criticism refers to that effort to put these together um, and, and make a harmony of it, right? And, um, and you know, you've got uh, scholars like Robert Alter, for instance, who wasn't even a biblical scholar, but he was, in fact, he was a, he is a student of modern uh, Jewish poetry. And uh, he had a, a real eye for just basic linguistics and how it works. And uh, supposed problems for source critics, he could explain like that and convinced a lot of people. To the point where, um, well, I guess, well, you know, ooh, can't control this. Uh, to the point where uh, the supposed redactors have done their job so well that you can't discern the sources anymore. Now think of what that means. Uh, John Barton, another highfalutin uh, biblical critic, uh, talks about this thing called the disappearing redactor. He's, a, he's the, the redactor, the, the guy who supposedly brings all these sources together, has done his job so well that he's left no imprint anymore uh, of the sources that he used. Guess what? He's an author all of a sudden. The only trouble is that someone like Barton will say, but of course we know Moses never existed, we can safely assume that now, so let's just call him Moses with a wink. Uh, and nowadays, uh, basically biblical scholars uh, have landed in, at the so-called assured result that the Pentateuch was essentially authored sometime in the exilic or post-exilic period, and well, there's a lot that goes with that, obviously. Um, okay, well... I guess the positive here is that at least now uh, mainstream academic scholars are starting to look at the texts as a whole and appreciate their theology in a more unified way. Not great, but better than it was. Uh, and this really comes to full flower in canonical criticism with Brevard Childs, who had an enormous influence uh, in recognizing books uh, in their totality and doing theology on that basis. Not trying to do theology on the basis of a whole lot of supposed sources, but doing it on the basis of the canon as it stands. Now, obviously, that's, that's a step in the right direction. Charles himself, though, was also a historical critic and assumed all that stuff, but at least he was going in the right direction. And uh, nowadays, one of the more, um, I think, helpful is the, the narrative approaches that we have uh, where the scholars are sensitive to the way narrative works and, you know, you just get a lot out of it. Um, there's, there's certainly a lot of good that's flowing out of that. Okay. I think I might uh, leave it at that, take up uh, the pastoral epistles next time and uh, at next session and take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Hensley. Immediately upon sitting down, I realized I forgot to, in the introduction, mention what is probably the most relevant thing for the LCA, and that as Dr. Henley has been called to be Old Testament lecturer at Australian Lutheran College beginning in 2017. So. <laughs> okay, we do have a few minutes. Questions, comments? Let's put the professor to the test. What do you reckon? Yeah, so. Matthew. I hope I didn't nod off for a split second, but did you um, cover Von Rath? Von Rath, I, I didn't talk about him, but he was there under tradition uh, criticism. Yeah, very, very influential guy, obviously. Um, yeah, I mean, he, he, he was part of, uh, sort of had a very innovative way of trying to salvage biblical theology, assuming all this stuff, and it could take a lot to get into him and explain how he did it. Uh, at the end of the day, I don't agree with him, so I, mean, I don't know whether I really want to uh, go too far down there. Thank you. Upstairs. Hello. Oh. Hello. Stephen Vanderhoek again. Sorry. Um, uh, look, I, um, I was just really interested in something you're saying about Spinoza and stuff, mm -hmm. um, just because he happens to be... Uh, a stubborn Dutch bastard like um, many others. Sorry, like myself. Sorry. <coughs> no, no, I was, but I was just going to say um, one, one thing that really struck me about, about when, you, when you said that um, 
um, about how he said to treat the Bible like any other literature. And it just strikes me as well how that en treating something like any other literature has changed and shifted over the centuries, even, even that, right? What I mean to say, even, even, in, even in, for example, the difference between the way my parents and my grandparents studied any other literature is very different to how I studied any other literature. Now, mm -hmm. for example, um, I've got an old pastor in my congregation who just recites large slabs of poetry. Um, my mum can recite large slabs of Shakespeare. Um, I can recite nothing. I mean, I can recite maybe the Jabberwocky or something, but that's about it. <laughs> now, now I, I've got interest in this because I'm a musician and I've had to memorise labs, large slabs of music at various times. But what, what, I, what I think, what I think, for example, when I was in high school, you know, we did Shakespeare's Macbeth. Sorry, I'm about Shakespeare again, but we were doing we were doing Shakespeare, and all of a sudden, as immediately we've read Act One, Scene One, and we immediately turn into these experts on Shakespeare's time, Shakespeare's culture. Shake like we all of a sudden we know everything, and we're just dissecting this thing like a frog. All right. Now take that. Now what I mean to say is that there's such a shift going on in terms of how do we actually approach literature anyway, not, not just take hmm. scripture out of the picture. But for example, if what Michael was saying about, about um, that if we take scripture on its own terms, you know, how do we take Shakespeare and Dickens and Lewis Carroll on their own terms as well, all right? They weren't, they weren't, they, they, they were just making their contribution to literature for their time. So, sorry, I know this is long-winded. What, 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 what I'm trying to say is that there's been a big shift, though, in how we even approach literature, whether or not it's to be deconstructed and dissected, or whether it's there to be enjoyed. Hmm. All right? And so bef before I've, you know, so the difference between the way I studied Macbeth and the way my mum studied Macbeth is that now in her <coughs> older age, um, she can actually enjoy the stuff, <laughs> all right? And, and, and I, I can't even remember half of it because all we did was deconstruct it. You know, now take that, now it, even in the old times, people were memorising large slabs of scripture and then when they got to their deathbed, no matter, even if they were some higher critical, you know, person, all of a sudden you are silent before Psalm 23 and it provides the comfort that you need to pass into the next life. I was just wondering if you could just make some comment about that. I'm sorry it took a while. To no, that's all right. Um, yeah, the, the thoughts I had as you were talking are that, uh, you know, the source criticism was first called literary criticism but it bore absolutely no resemblance to literary criticism. Not, not done in any other field. It was uniquely de deconstructive, uh, deconstructed to a unique extent, uh, biblical text in a way that literary critics never did. Um, that would be my main comment, uh, that, that it's always, biblical studies on this has always been a little bit um, kind of off on its own. Uh, with, with higher criticism uh, and, and has been particularly suspicious of the integrity of its text in a way that other literature critics have not been uh, outside. Pastor Andrew Adele from St John's Dinner Court. Uh, I was wondering if you could just give us a short outline of how it has changed like in the last decade or so with the critique of the five source theory like Joanne Garrett and Oh yeah. Uh, well, one couple of things. Uh, J and E are no longer dependable uh, indicators of separate sources. They tell us. Um, just going on what they say. <laughs> um, even oh, another one, a pretty serious one. Um, by the name, what's his name? Um, I have it somewhere. Uh, it reverses the order of the last two. The Deuteronomist is apparently the last writer, not the priestly writer. That's very different from Wellhausen. Now, Wellhausen's big thing was to make the priestly writer last. Uh, 
Originally, the documentary hypothesis had uh, the priestly writer first, and then J, the Yahweh, then Elohist, and then the Deuteronomist, in that order. So the priestly material, all that sacrifice stuff in Leviticus and whatever, that was the older stuff. But Wellhausen said, no, no, that, that came later, and see how it fits the reconstructed history of Israel. Here's how it works. The priestly guys were just trying to consolidate their power and, and make everybody follow their rules. Uh, but nowadays, the Deuteronomist is apparently the latest, according to at least one modern historical critic. Uh, that would be some of the ways in which it's, it's, um, it's what I call a house of cards. I mean, these guys don't know. They're just guessing and uh, making all these sorts of um, reconstructions based on, on internal evidence, which is already uh, predisposed to see differences or, or contradictions, where I would say, look, look see it? It's a, sure, it's a bump in the text. But go at it with the confidence that you, um, you would any bump, slowly, carefully, and work it out. Don't assume the problems with Scripture. Assume it's with your understanding. <laughs> Hope that helps. Oh, th thanks, Adam, for your presentation and uh, bringing this all together. Uh, Pastor Mike Stikey, Mid-Murray Parish. Um, you mentioned Wellhausen uh, knew very little of Judaism um, and that um, our study of Judaism and knowledge of it has enhanced uh, our understanding of the scriptures. Where does a knowledge of history, religious um, customs, traditions of the time, family, other cultural practices, where does the knowledge of that enhance our um, understanding of the scripture and wh where is the line where it turns from enhancing it into, um, you know, being used uh, sure. to no, promote scepticism? Good question. I, I look, I think it comes down to the attitude of scepticism or appreciation. And I, I, I hesitate to say there's a particular line uh, because, you know, honestly, when, when you're looking at different parts of the Old Testament, I'm thinking Old Testament, that's my area, but... Um, you know, you, you're handling different parts of it differently because, frankly, it's different. You know, there's a great deal of diversity there. The, the pr proverbial writings, the Psalms, the uh, narrative writings and the uh, Pentateuch and the historiography of the Bible there, Samuel and Kings and so forth. Um, but, you know, all this is, this is really important. This only helps us, uh, except that a lot of the times... Um, it's, it's more the attitude that, that's the problem here. It's not the, not the evidence. It's just how you string stuff together, how you draw it together uh, is often, I think, uh, misguided or misdirected because there's an undue scepticism or agnosticism about the reliability of the text. I mean, you, you see this in, um, in the minimalism of the latter part of the 20th century where people were trying to uh, redefine the history of Israel, where Israel came from in Canaan and all that. And... Um, to the point where people are denying the existence of David. I mean, it, it's that, it was that bad in the 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, and nowadays pendulum might be sort of swinging back a bit, it's hard to say, but, um, but it, that's just a scepticism that's born of, oh, we just can't trust this text, it's an ideological text, it's got an axe to grind, it's all about justifying Israel in, in the promised land, and, and see, some of these modern day political issues that, that are, are are real issues for us in the world today, I think play a big part here. People are concerned about, well, um, you know, should Israel be there or not? And this kind of determines their thinking on it, on the reliability of the text as well. Should it? I don't believe so. Uh, whatever you think about that, you should be able to uh, read the literature and, and appreciate it and not automatically suspect it of, of falsehood somehow. But anyway. Final, final question. Personally, I don't think it's changed very much. My name's Claire Schutz from... Well, I'm living at Kalsbury. Um, what I was going to comment is when the time of Jesus was, you had the Pharisees always fighting about, oh, does this happen? You had the Sadducees saying another thing. And I really don't think mankind's really changed very much. <laughs> Basically, they're always trying to argue over something. More and things they, change, the more they And if they can same. pick on the Word of God to do so, that's another way of leading people away from Christ, not towards Christ, and allowing the Holy Spirit to really work. Michael, are you willing to wait? It's time for a break, and we'll, uh, we'll continue. Hold your questions. We, ha uh, we have an announcement. <laughs>
Oh, yes, there will be uh, feedback forms. Uh, we would appreciate if uh, you could uh, have a little look at those and help us to prepare perhaps better for a future time. Thank you. They're on the registration table on your way over to afternoon tea. Afternoon tea until 2.30. Thank you.